Good afternoon. Hello. Good, Hi, good afternoon. afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, wherever you are in Nigeria, in Africa, across the world. We welcome you to the webinar on strategic communication in the trajectory of a pandemic. This webinar is put together by the International Association of Business Communicators, West Africa Interest Group. We are glad to have you here. As at this morning, we had about 150 participants registered. We welcome you all. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for looking in. And we believe that we'll have a meaningful time of discussing issues around the pandemic and issues around communication, issues around the management of our organizations and our lives. Welcome once more. Thank you. We will be having a panel of discussants and I will ask them to introduce themselves as we begin. Uh, as at this moment, the numbers are growing, the number of participants. Welcome, as you look in, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, but let me tell you about IABC West Africa Interest Group. The International Association of Business Communicators, West Africa Interest Group, is a member of the Africa region of the Global Association. We provide a platform for West African professional business communicators who are keen to excel in their careers and improve on their knowledge and practice of the communication profession. In addition, we provide networking opportunities and avail experts the opportunity to mentor and profess their expertise to a varied audience within the profession. The global body, as well as the Africa region, hosts separate annual conferences covering communication trends, recent topics, and new technologies that impact the profession or the professional. We are currently working on offering a range of certifications and programs as well as workshops in conjunction with the global body and reputable institutions. That's about the West Africa Interest Group. And the West Africa Interest Group, our own Shola Abulu heads it. She's, uh, Shola is a communication strategist with over 25 years varied experience in corporate communications. And external relations. Most of her career was spent at Shell, Nigeria, where she was until 2019, the external relations and communications manager for Shell, Nigeria, based in Lagos. She also worked in the company's headquarters in The Hague as a senior international advisor on Nigeria and championed the 2019 UK project aimed at deepening understanding of business relevant social society trends. During her tenure, she led an intensive campaign to successfully raise Shell Nigeria's media profile for their deep water operation over a three year period. Shell developed a framework for delivering business integrated communication strategy for effective non technical risk management on major oil and gas projects and harnessed a robust talent pipeline with world expertise in strategic communication and crisis management. Shala current supports organizations and business leaders to build on enabling business delivery, championing brand advocacy, and supporting reputation risk and crisis management. In her role as principal consultant for Shala Abu and Associates, a strategy and communications consultancy based in Lagos. She sits on the Africa board, the International 
Association of Business Communicators as Director for West Africa Membership Outreach. Shalabulu is our host today. Okay, thank you for welcoming Shola. We'll go to our panelists. Our panelists today, and as I introduce them, I will ask that they speak to us, tell us a little more about themselves. We have Anne Eze. Anne Eze is the Communication Director for GE's Gas Power Business for Sub-Saharan Africa. Anne, welcome. Thank you, Chido. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Everyone, really glad to be here with you all today. Um, Anne is, so I lead communications for the gas power business for, for GE, for Sub-Saharan Africa. I have been in the energy industry for 15 years, uh, leading communications um, across various um, regions. Uh, and in the last three and a half years with GE, I lead internal and external communications. I am multilingual, I speak French and English. Um, currently studying Arabic, fingers crossed how that goes. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Thanks, Chido. Welcome. Thank you. Next is Omoni Ibietan. Dr. Ibietan is a freshly minted PhD. And so you can imagine that he's <laughs> full of ideas in communication. Dr. Ibietan, welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm happy to, to be part of this process of, uh, of learning. Um, I work with the Nigerian Communications Commission uh, and I'm in Consumer Affairs Bureau. I handle information, uh, consumer information and education. Uh, I have been in this uh, communication business for about uh, two decades, I mean, including uh, volunteerism, moving between that and the academia, and then, of course, uh, back to the public service. I, I served uh, Honorable Frank Mwike Jr. as a special media advisor when he was Minister of Information and Communication. And uh, that was the beginning of my career in the public sector. Um, I've moved in and out. Uh, I'm just so happy to be here to learn. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the other panelists, Ukwari Ejibe who is a strategic communications change management and partnerships lead for the Tony Blair Ukuri. Yes, good welcome. Afternoon. Thank you very much, Chido. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ukuri, and I work for the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, and I support the Nigeria Center for Disease Control on strategic communications. And um, most recently, um, leading the crisis communications team for um, COVID response. So, really Thanks happy so to. Much. Be here. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, those are our panelists. They'll be talking to us. I am Chido Benedict Mwakama. I am a communication strategist. I have worked across the communication table in journalism, on the agent side, on client side, in marketing, and now in academia. I run Blue Flower Limited strategic communication firm, and we provide businesses with key tools necessary for managing business communications across stakeholder divisions and corporate segments. I have been president of the International Association of Business Communicators, Nigeria, and the past president of the Publishers Consultants Association, Nigeria. I teach at the School of Media and Communication as an adjunct faculty, and I am still learning, trying to cap my education. It will be my pleasure to pilot this session with all of these very experienced communication professionals. Okay, so let's get on with it. I will start with Ukori, who is currently assisting the NCDC. 
So we'll be looking at the pandemic communication. And I'd like for her to talk to us about the experience. What has been the experience of NCDC in managing communication of the pandemic to Nigerians? What strategies and steps have they taken so far? Okay. Okay, thanks, thanks, Chief, um, for that question. Um, I, I will start by saying, you know, that as communications professionals, we start up with a blueprint of maybe what crisis communication should look like. And um, I think that the, this plan has defied every, um, every written in the book. Some of the strategies would work, but, you know, defied it because there's, you don't have a start and an end, um, opposed to other crises that you know you can see the end inside. Um, things are changing um, very rapidly. Um, there's no cure, although you know there's research being done um, around um, vaccines and medications that will work to manage the symptoms. And so when you look at all of those things, you you know that is an ultimate um, communicator's challenge. Um, especially in this time, and being at the heart of it, working for um, the agent that is leading the communication, the public health response um, to to the COVID nineteen crisis in in Nigeria is absolutely challenging. So, in there, there are different things that you know, we're we're having to battle with. So, apart from the things that I've mentioned, in not knowing what is going on, where the end is coming, um, having to turn guidelines as the scientific evidence changes. Um, you're also dealing with fake news and um, conspiracy theories and people not believing that COVID is real um, in Nigeria. So in the sea of that, um, NCDC communication has been working you know, to um, make sure that we keep Nigerians informed, um, at least even change the perception of people who don't believe that, you know, COVID-19 exists. So in, if you're asking me the strategies that, you know, um, NTDC has put in place to respond, I think that there are things that we definitely did a little bit of before the pandemic started. So, for example, we had a skeletal crisis communications plan um, and with that, we knew that we also had to train spokespersons within the organization. So that interestingly was done last year. Um, so a couple of people were trained within the organization to um, support the director general when there, when there was, when an outbreak comes up or now a pandemic. Um, then we also, um, had roles and responsibilities for a crisis communications team. Um, and that in its own has also helped when the DG activated the crisis communications team um, because we could identify the people we wanted on the team and have definitely evolved as we moved along. Um, so in, in terms of the actual strategies that we've used, it's been a, a week on week um, kind of response because things are changing very rapidly so you can't have you know a strategy that moves um way past um a long period of time even though um because ncdc is a big health agency there's also a risk communications backing and you have to use science in communication so there's an overall arcing and strategy in terms of communications, but you know the actual work has been done week on week um, in terms of identifying the messaging priorities that you need um, and breaking it down into key messages, getting the outputs out um, based on those messages and the audiences you're looking for and the channels to reach them um, and down to dissemination of the messages to professional associations, to states, to CSOs, to the MDAs who are involved in, in the response because it's not a, it, it really takes a village really um, for the COVID-19 response. So we're having work um, a, a lot with different agencies to make sure that you know, we respond um, effectively and very 
important thing. We've been using data to drive our messaging strategic priorities. So data that comes from polling our partners, from our meaning on social media and, um, and media, traditional media monitoring and qualitative um, comments that we see anywhere or in conversations with people. Those are the things basically, and obviously changing evidence that comes from bodies like WHO or the scientific um, organizations that we trust and also internal research. So we basically um, refine our messages then continue. So I, I will stop here um, for now in terms of that. Thank you. Uh, my second question goes to both yourself and me. I'd like me to address it first. There is a general perception that Nigerians are skeptical about even the existence of the pandemic four months after. Indeed, your NCNC NC was uh, uh, implicated somehow in all this belief because some persons spread the story that 5G was part of the causative factors for uh, the pandemic for COVID-19. What, what have you done? Uh, what factors are responsible for this cynicism? And what are you doing from the communication end at your organization and with you also wearing the cap of one of those assisting NCDC with uh, stakeholder communication using influencers? I will go back to Ukori, but please, me. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Um, thank you. Um, the question you raised had to do with um, what may be responsible for the cynicism. Yeah. I think it is. I think it's in, it's in human nature to to try to be apprehensive when there is going to be a fundamental change. We had seen what happened in other countries. And then here we are in Nigeria, people already felt, look, we were going to be hit by this situation. And we don't want this to happen, but it has to happen. And so the mindset, you know, migrated to the point where we better assume that this does not exist. Because you have to remember, in, in, in climes where this had taken place, where processes had been instituted to ensure that the spread is contained, the, there are things that have been put in place in those jurisdictions. First, I will talk about social security system, which is largely absent here. So when people already envisage that, look, there is going to be a lockdown, we will not be able to go out, and there are people whose sustenance depend on what they earn on a daily basis. They have two options, either to confront the challenge or to just uh, live in denial. That is one. The, the, the second issue, is the nature of our system, and I mean the social system. In, in certain parts of the country, those who control governance are not necessarily those who control the people on the streets. Those on the street listen essentially to a different category of people. Look at an example of what happened in some of the cities where people, mm -hmm. Clerics and people that are respected in society came out clearly to, to, to tell the populace that this thing, that, that, the, that the virus does not exist. They will, people have been structured in such a way that they would rather listen to those people th than listen to, to, to those who are in charge of, uh, of the institutional processes of governance. And so you have the majority of the people going about their business as they move about, the, they, are, they, they, they were spreading the virus without knowing. So, so these are the issues. First and foremost, by way of recall, the, 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 the fact that people are afraid of change. Their lives were going to be changed fundamentally, so it's either to accept it or live in denial. If you lock people up, how do they survive? The provision were not made. As you are aware, at the risk of immodesty, I, I was a student in South Africa, and I know that there are almost five levels of social security system in South Africa. So when the South African government decided to impose a lockdown, the citizens know that their accounts will be credited to enable them to survive. But in spite of that, you could see the resistance at some point in South Africa, how there was even a spike in domestic violence from people who already were used to going out 
but who are now have to be confined to their homes to contain the spread. So, so this is one aspect of, uh, of it. Now, you raise issue concerning um, the issue of uh, 5G being, uh, COVID being responsible for spread and what have you. I would say that uh, that's unfortunate. I mean, at this forum, I really do not speak for NCC. However, I will, I will share with you what is already in the public domain. You know, the organization came out clearly to tell the public that there is no correlation. And we rely on what experts have said. The, 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 the 5G uh, technology do not necess does not necessarily come with a higher level of radiation that we already have in the existing generation networks. That was made very clear. But people will not say, listen. In fact, it, it got heightened to the point where clerics also began to have a linkage between coronavirus and, and prophetic statements, you know, I mean, so to say, to say, oh, these are end times. And then when your pastor comes out or, your, or, your, or an Islamic cleric comes out to say this, there is a tendency for you to want to believe, depending on your own mindset about religion. So the, the, the thing was, was linked to, to, to 5G, but of course we know as we speak that uh, there is no empirical evidence to show that uh, coronavirus and 5G have any correlation uh, whatsoever. So the burden, the burden is for us to go out to let people realize that there is no correlation. And we must show people evidence to really show that there is no correlation. And I assure you that a campaign will go on as soon as new facts come from the processes that have been instituted by the commission, there will be a new campaign to sensitize people about this. I'm going to stop here for now. Thank you. Uh, I go back to Corey. So here we are, a, a complex of issues uh, around coronavirus and managing communication of the pandemic. Where you, where we are now, what is the next step? What are you doing? What is NCDC doing of you in that crisis communication room to reassure people, ensure that there is increased buying to the fact that the nation is managing the situation? What are you doing? Ni mentioned some really good points about the factors that you know drive people's perception on whether you know COVID exists or not. And I'll just recap because most of the the, the strategies that we put in place is also just to address as as we can. And so in terms of denial, um, maybe fake news or the 5G and a host of other ones. Um, speculations um, coming up and down, conspiracy theories. Um, there's another one I want to point out. Um, the mistrust of governments is also very big um, there as well because, I mean, we have to think about it. It's been how many years of Nigerians not trusting the government. So you can't just um, come with COVID-19 restaurants and all of a sudden everything has been fixed or the system is working perfectly. So it's also an accumulation of that that we all we have to pay great um, attention to. So I'll just go in quickly with um, what um, NTBC has been doing. Um, very early on, when we we had when we constituted the crisis communications team, rumor management was very key, and we have a thing for rumor management. Um, and um, there are different strategies that we use within the rumor management team based on the signals that we're getting to be rank them. If it's something that needs to be dispelled immediately, we dispel. If it's something that um, some of the partners or other agencies we work with need to pay attention to, we escalate. Um, if there's um, something that we respond to immediately but incorporate in our messaging over a couple of weeks, we do so as well because sometimes you you dispel or you, de you debug a rumor but you need to reinforce 
Um, and um, we've also partnered with um, local fact-checking organizations. So sometimes we might not come out directly to say this is a rumor with this, but we use um, other mediums to, um, to debunk the rumor and make sure that you know, it goes down to grassroots. And in addition to that, we do a lot of listening. So as we're debunking, we're also listening and getting the signals from the states from partners from social media. Um, working with partners, apart from the local fact-checking um, organization, the, the partners that we work with or other agencies, we also send them information on the rumors that are going around and our response to it. So they can also disseminate through um, their channels. Um, but importantly, I think that I, he was talking about the medium, right? So we've also seen the examples where religious leaders will say otherwise, whether they're Muslim or Christian. Um, and we've also invested in training um, religious leaders um, on COVID-19, um, the symptoms, prevention, and information around it. So they're also better informed really to help their constituents who are working with associations. And just to mention, I mean, when we talk about, about the communications response to COVID-19, it's so much more than we're seeing. It's not an NCDC only feat. Um, you also have um, structures like the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 also pulling their weight um, in terms of the communications as well. So, you know, these are the various uh, channels or partners that we work with, even to um, debunk um, rumors or misinformation that come up. And I think another very important one is encouraging um, survivors to speak up about their story because that's one of the ways to um, dispel you know, or to help with the perception that it doesn't um, exist. And in the past two weeks, to be honest, we're seeing a change based on the data that we're seeing, whether people now know that, you know, someone you know has had COVID, um, you know, post to in the beginning where it was uh, a, a handful of cases you couldn't connect. You know, the conversations we're now having or having these symptoms, you know, I want to get tested. Um, I, we will admit that, you know, compliance is still low. Um, so it's one of the things we'll focus on this next phase of our um, communications. But in terms of, you know, the strategies that we put in place, these are the, some, some of the things that we've been doing. And partnerships with technology, um, you know, companies like Facebook, Google, Twitter, if you just Google um, COVID-19 or something about COVID-19 on Google or Facebook or Twitter, it would show the NCDC first as a trusted source of information. And these are, one, these are things that we did very early on so people can go um, to our um, site. And we also set up a microsite um, that is solely for COVID-19 related resources. Um, so as we develop materials and put information, that's where, you know, we direct people to go, as well as having a WhatsApp API where people can ask us questions and chat with um, agents from the NCDC as well. Thank you very much, Corey. Uh, uh, great task, multi-stakeholder communication. I will go to one stakeholder. And uh, I come to Anne Eze. You run communication for a major player uh, across West Africa. So my question is, what should communication professionals do in internal communications about the pandemic, your internal publics? Um, thank you very much, uh, Chido. I, I would say it's <laughs> leading communications for, for gas power one of the things we do is to really partner with the human resources um, leadership and team on the region because very quickly as uh, COVID hit and people were forced to kind of work from home um, and manage online learning, I think we quickly realized that employees were struggling seriously managing the challenges of just work from home realities um, and, and the online learning and, and balancing those um, challenges. And I think one of the first things we, we kind of did was we realized we couldn't 
had do business as usual, right? We didn't have the physical community to tackle that challenge. You know, what we have normally done pre-COVID was, you know, have town halls, have um, coffees, have breakfast meetings, come together as a team to kind of, you know, assuage the fears of people, you know, help them walk through the anxieties. But we didn't have any of that anymore. Everyone was working from home. Everyone was isolated. Everyone was independent, right? So we quickly had to think of strategies to put in place to combat this. One of it was pretty much tripling our listening. So we put up listening sessions, um, informal and formal, with different sets of teams, different groups of employees, to really just give people the opportunity to express their anxieties, express their fears, listen to them, talk them through, really help them navigate the, um, the entire COVID you know, reality. And I think what that did for us was it gave us an empathetic voice. It helped us really connect with the employees so that they knew that even though they were kind of apart from each other, not coming into the office, um, locked in their homes, they still stayed connected to, to the core of the business, to the core of the community. And we, we've continued to you know, manage those sessions. Some, some sessions literally had no agenda. Like some were quite formal with structured agendas and some had absolutely no agenda because we just wanted people you know, to come on and share. We were very, uh, I would say very liberal with allowing folks to bring their kids you know, online to the screen because I mean, you're, you're working from home, you have to just come to terms with that reality that your employee population now have a different set of challenges, right? So kids will come on, on screen, would hear, hear them in the background and it was okay. We made employees realize that it was okay, right? And they, they could manage um, that kind of transition. I would say the second thing we did um, on, the, on, the internal, on the internal scale was really pivoting our business campaigns and making sure that they had human impact. So if you go to our social media channels today, you would see, I think the most recent was the Father's Day campaign, which would have typically been, you know, just a couple of profiles um, celebrating fathers. But what we did this time around was blend the business and the human side, right? So portraying our employees who were on the front lines, who were at power plants, who were kind of just helping to keep business continuity for the company, but also provide critical services for the community and showing how they showed up at work, but also how they showed up at home. So we had you know, like a, a slew of profiles of um, employees, fathers from across the region, celebrating them, recognizing them, and using them as kind of you know, keyholes into the kind of you know, employee population that we had. Um, and I would say the third, and I, I think I find that maybe the most successful, was that we, we really amplified our internal voice. So creating WhatsApp groups, um, and animating those groups to make sure that they had non-business, you know, realities, exercise challenges, um, cooking challenges, uh, reading challenges, you know, just sharing ideas, sharing ideas, especially with regards to the challenges that people were facing, right? How are you coping with your kids' um, online school? Did you buy laptops? Did you, you know, do, are you using desktops? What are you going to do with them for some in distance, you know, the employee or employer voice from the reality of the employee situation? And I think that has really helped us, one, keep our employee population engaged um, and definitely really raise the bar in terms of their retention, in terms of their connection to the, to the, to the organization and really helping them navigate this, um, this change. So in, in, I would say my recommendation to, to those who lead internal communications in um, during this time is really to harness, you know, these tools, you know, forget some of the straight jacketed uh, communication guidelines and really be human and empathize with your employees and help them navigate this change. Thank you very much, Anne. A lot of learnings from what you have done. The first is the importance of connectedness. You have emphasized that. And one of the things you've just said that I found very interesting, you're blending the business and the family because people are working from home. So they are taking family time. Uh, and therefore, it, companies have to make room for the incorporation of the family. It's, it's an interesting learning that we can take forward uh, that there is no clear division between the man as worker 
and the woman as family person. <laughs> it's, it's an integrated whole. Thank you. And then you said uh, people should amplify the internal. voice and emphasize business continuity so yes we are separated physically important indeed that leads us on to discussing the stakeholder and brand and i'll start with okori what will determine the longevity or perhaps relevance of the corporate brand and reputation of a business in the next six months we've just used six months as a guide because nobody knows when this pandemic will end but what will what what should we be doing what will determine it so i i think for for businesses for corporate organizations um and i'm taking myself away from you know being a communicator um is being able to connect with your audiences in terms of what they need right now um, so it might not be necessarily the marketing of your, of your products, but, you know, saying that I care um, in different ways, whether it's providing information um, to, to them that are necessary, whether it's um, just um, showcasing how your brand is um, helping out in the COVID-19 response and caring about the community. I think that you know these are the, um, the defining factors. So I've been supporting public sector, but I've also seen some some private sector examples that have taken me back a little bit. So in the Nigerian context, people like Airpeace have blown me away um, in this pandemic, really. And it's not that they've done much. What have they done? They are just showing me that they're connecting people with their families right and um, taking evacuating people to other countries bringing nigerians back home to connect back with their families um and sometimes have one minute videos saying oh i miss you all i know that you will fly but it cannot happen right now but we're all in this together and um most recently processes of um of domestic um air space coming up again and how that would affect me as a consumer um, or uh, a traveler basically and how I can adapt to or what is expected of me and I think that you know this is one thing for brand really to learn that you know your your objectives um, or business goals also to go back to the heart of what your audience is needing at that particular point in time and that helps them to connect with you and in a way ensures that sustainability over time even as things change so thank you very much uh, uh, Kido, if, I I may, if i may add here yeah yeah if yeah. i may add here, you know, so i think organizations need to realize that in the next six months this pandemic is still going to be we only need to look at europe and us to see how they have progressed along the trajectory of this pandemic it's, it's still going to be a reality right the travel restrictions the workplace regulations the reduced spending the delayed investments the disrupted supply chains like all these challenges will still remain right in the next six months so how do we stay relevant i think number one is making safety a priority organizations need to kind of really understand that safety is key it is not a business it's, it's no longer a nice to have it's a must have and to ensure that yeah and to ensure that they are they are contributing their brand voice um to the global safety narrative that um Corey has mentioned i would say the second thing is as spending has reduced you know budget cuts are in place communicators need to innovate right yes your business must continue yes you need to continue to render services but to equal point you know what epis is doing or what many other organizations are doing is really pivoting and innovating so that they don't literally die off right and they continue to kind of run with the current trends the current themes that are out there in in the in the external environment but tie their brand voice to it 
so that they remain, you know, they remain relevant to, to, their, to their stakeholders. I think this is really, really important. Okay, thank you, good of you. I appreciate the points you've made about staying connected in spite of all of the disconnect that has happened about caring, showing care, just showing that you care beyond profit because right now uh, the, 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 the customer out there, the stakeholder out there is bothered about survival and so you have emphasized safety, the safety messaging and we need to know that organizations also are talking about safety not just their sales of their products or all that. Uh, let's, let's move on. Uh, Ni, yes, looking at your stakeholder map, what category of stakeholders would you say are critical to an organization remaining relevant today and have the needed depth of loyalty that will build their brand longevity? Well, thank not you just very much. organization, but generally. Yeah, well. Generally, I'm going to, you know, charity, they say, begins at home. So I'm going to start from home by just uh, proceeding from where uh, Okori and Anne stopped to say quickly, the measures that were instituted by Nigerian Communications Commission was to take life as a priority. And so immediately the alert came. There was a cessation of work. Even though the federal government had declared the telecom sector as an essential service, and we also had realized, of course, by what we do, that we are very central to the processes. Because when you talk of connectedness, we are at the heart of connecting people. And so right from the messaging that we, we got from ITU, which is the United Nations Agency that superintends the telecom sector, we knew that the consumers of telecom have to remain connected for the period. Because uh, both work, and leisure and schooling, I mean, had migrated to, to the homes. And so the most important thing is services have to continue. And so the commission ensure that all the processes that will ensure that there is no disruption to telecom services were put in place. And so some people still have to come to work to ensure that those things are sustained. But while at work, I mean, distancing, mass uh, using of mass uh washing of hands all those processes were put in place i mean of course we have always had this at the commission but we also re uh, emphasize this now uh, going back to your question sir stakeholder mainstreaming within covid does not take uh, a fundamentally different uh, uh perspective compared to mainstreaming of stakeholder at the normal time however the point I made in that regard is that you are not likely to have a shrinkage, a kind of constriction in the geography of your stakeholders. They may expand, but there will be what I would call prioritization. And I'll give you an example. Before COVID, of course, we consider NCDC as a, as a, as a, as a, a strategic stakeholder, but there was a redefinition of the nature of stakeholding that we have with NCDC because one, the Nigerian Communications Commission made the emergency communication centers available to be used by those who are infected or affected, you know, by the virus to be able to access uh, uh, the people that will, will help to manage the situation. So the, 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 the emergency communication centers, 18 of them, one in the FCT, 17 in other states of the Federation, were made available by the Nigerian Communications Commission to NCDC to ensure that people are able to access the services that require to manage the, uh, the contagion. Now, the other issue is we were in touch constantly with the consumers, I mean, whom we feel, and rightly so, are the lifeblood of the telecom sector. Like Anne had, had stated, Every message that we put out since, the, since this uh, contagion uh, broke out, we ensure that we hashtag our communication in such a way that the question of safe uh, distancing, the question of hand washing, using sanitizers, 
all those measures as have been, of course, uh, put in place by NCDC. We just amplified NCD's voice by making sure that we hashtag that on our communication. And if you see all the communication um, uh, content that had been put out by N NCC since this uh, happened, all of them were, had this hashtag on them. Things come to the hashtag. It's a way of ensuring that those, those who are our stakeholders remain connected to us. And it's also a way of empathizing because songs, I mean, what I mean, normal as a status quo ante, when, because the new normal is the fact that we have to operate outside the normal uh, uh, processes. Now, when, when that return, you know, loyalty will be extended by those who saw you at the point of their travails. And I think that was the point that Anne had emphasized, which of course, Kukori also mentioned concerning what Airpeace has done. Remember that if, for instance, those players in those sectors are not found to have done the same thing, when, we return, when life returns to normal, chances are that customers are going to continue to patronize those who were in touch with them while these challenges were on. So all these, uh, we ensure that uh, we, we are able to do, to, to, to keep in touch. However, sir, you will also remember as somebody who also uh, is a, uh, a, a player in the sector uh, as, as a key communication strat uh, strategist, you know also that telecom, com telecom operators in Nigeria also offer support. They were encouraged by the commission to offer support to NCDC. I mean, as telecom consumers, I'm sure you got regular alerts informing you of what you need to do to prevent uh, the virus from spreading. You also remember that you got free SMS uh, from my telecom operators, I mean, up to 10 by some of them in a day for, for a period. And, and so in terms of devices that are also required by organizations like N NCDC and, and its partners to function well, and I'm referring to mobile handsets, I mean, recharge cards, they were made available by many telecom operators. I mean, of course, with the encouragement of the Nigerian Communications Commission. So in a way, we, the Nigerian Communications Commission ensure that it is connected to key stakeholders, I mean, in, this, in the telecom ecosystem, such that, I mean, beyond the question of empathy, to enable them also be able to cushion the effect of the fact that people are not able to spend as much as they would have loved to spend. So much as you have to buy data, you also have as, had access to free SMS to be able to, to keep your life going. So, so this is the sense in which I said that uh, uh, we have remained connected uh, to all our stakeholders and have been able to also uh, propagate uh, our brand by so doing. I would like to stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, here is a question from our audience. Um, Hey, Chido, just want to, to add to what Ni is saying around uh, stakeholders um, from, from a business private sector perspective, right? For us, there, there, there were three stakeholders, and I think most organizations have three stakeholders. One, your employees. They are your brand ambassadors. They, they are kind of the voice of the company. So making sure that you give them the right focus throughout this pandemic is critical because they will whatever they say or do outside of the company will impact your business um you you putting in place stay at home um initiatives for example are not only you know important they are critical i think the second stakeholder from a private sector perspective is your customers how are you showing up for them in in this pandemic how are you showing up how are you putting initiatives in place to support the continuity of their own business, especially if you're in the service sector. I, I can give you the example of GE, right? We, we kind of run power plants. We, 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 we manage a third of the power in the world. If we do not put in place initiatives to help our customers survive through this COVID, when the pandemic is over, they will literally forget about us, right? So even as we try to keep the impact and the challenges of COVID in mind, as, as an organization, we've, we have had to sit down around the table to say, how can we overcome some of these challenges to get our technicians to the field, to get them to continue to support our customers so that people who are at home continue to have you know, 
no electricity to do what they're supposed to do. Uh, and I think the third, and probably also a very critical one, is the government. Every single government today is dealing with this pandemic. They are under immense pressure to try to battle this virus, right? So how are organizations showing up? Ukori mentioned around uh, EPI's um, knee, around the NCC, and how they are supporting, you know, with you know either you know free SMSs or free communication tools. Every organization has to chip in, in one form or the other, just to show corporate responsibility. Right? It could be financing, it could be, I mean, we've seen a whole lot, uh, I can give one, GE for an example, donated a seven figure amount to the GE Foundation to be able to support you know, COVID initiatives. So these are, from a private sector perspective, these are three stakeholders that are completely critical to, to manage right, through this pandemic so that when it's over, you still have you know, some, some form of business relationship uh, or brand loyalty with them. Thank you very much. Uh, still, you are on again. Uh, and Eitayo Alo has a question. He, he says, "You speak of increased listening, which I guess we are mostly virtual. One of the derived health issues facing organizations has been Zoom fatigue, a mental health concern, and anxiety of employees attending so many of the virtual online." listening sessions. How has the organization dealt with this without losing sight of the COVID communication? Very interesting question. Um, so I think very uh, within the organization, we have done kind of a pretty fair job of helping people not just balance, you know, the, the workload versus the family, but really creating harmony. Right. So internally in GE, you hear a lot more around harmony versus balance because, I mean, let's be, let's be frank, balance is kind of uh, a, a, maybe now extinct, I would say. You really have to find harmony and not just at a high level. So what we have done is we have empowered people leaders, so team managers, team leaders, to make sure that they are not just focused on, you know, deliver, deliver, deliver. They really are managing their people's health and how they support the organization. So you would see check, checking, you know, touch points with, with employees that are only just a, hey, how are you? What are you doing? Um, how can I help? Do you need help? Really unconnected to what they're supposed to deliver for the organization. One good example we had, um, I received an email from the HR partner for the region asking leaders, you know, pretty much giving everyone a checklist of 10 people that you're mandated to check up on, not related to business, really checking up on them in their mental state, where they're, how they are faring, how you can support, how you can coach, mentor them um, all through this. It really has come down from the leadership level to really team leads um, and people leaders across the organization, right? Not just in, in Nigeria, for example. I would say the second thing maybe is um, really be intentional around spacing out the work. So we had um, a team meeting, I think, during the week. And one of the, the points on the agenda is taking a vacation. Don't assume because you're working from home, you no longer you know, are entitled to a vacation. So the, the, the really pretty much instruction is make sure you plan that vacation, make sure you put it in the calendar, make sure it's clear for everyone and you actually do take the time, switch up, disconnect, um, and you know, reach out and come back. So, the excuse of, not even excuse, the, the reasoning that because you're working from home, you're no longer entitled to a vacation does not exist and employees feel comfortable that, you know, this organization doesn't just care about the work I deliver, they also care about my mental health. And I think I would encourage leaders across, you know, different organizations, public or private sector, to kind of put this, you know, in mind um, as, they, as they lead their teams, right? It, it's not just, you know, deliver, deliver, deliver. These are humans, you know, you have to empathize and you have to really put in place systemic, you know, methods to help them manage, you know, manage through this pandemic. Okay, thank you. Uh, Zoom fatigue. <laughs> is, it, is it a challenge and what, what do we do about it? What have you done? Any of, any of our panelists, what have you done? Zoom fatigue, are people getting tired of Zoom sessions? Well, um, I, I would just say that um, at the Nigerian Communications Commission, 
um, I wouldn't think that uh, we experience fatigue. By the way, I mean, consistent with the directive uh, of the federal government, only people of, uh, from level 14 and above are allowed to be at work. And so that already means that uh, maybe we'll have just about 30% of the workforce. And meetings are not slated just arbitrarily. Those things are scheduled. And of course, in our organization, we don't use Zoom. We use uh, the Microsoft Teams, which is, of, of course, uh, I mean, something we consider uh, safer. And so it's very unlikely. I haven't seen in NCC where you will have two online meetings in a day. Since the lockdown commenced, it's been strictly just one, sometimes not even every day as the need arises. By the way, physical meetings take place among people, provided they are not more than four, and then, of course, in a very big space. So big uh, me uh, meetings that involve large group of people, like a senior management uh, team, are uh, those you will find on the Microsoft team. So uh, in, in a sense, because of the way these meetings are spaced at the Nigerian Communications Commission, uh, people don't have fatigue. And I, I will say once again that you wouldn't have more than one in a day, and it's not going to, so, to, uh, to be so long as uh, to get people so tired and bored. Okay. Zoom fatigue, is it a challenge? Am I supposed to answer this? <laughs> <laughs> Where you're expecting us to keep Nigerians safe, I will pass on this question. the <laughs> <laughs> discussion. Is it are, are stakeholders complaining Zoom fatigue, or is it just uh, our entire law who has raised the issue? Well, well I, I think I think essentially it depends on how these things are structured. I just told you our experience. You, sir, I'll let you know this. Do you know that the regular outreach program, the Telecom Consumer Parliament, is slated to hold online shortly by the NCC? We, I mean, we just had the Industry uh, Consumer Advisory Forum. And uh, I mean, it went on very well. People are not, uh, are not complaining. L like I said, I mean, it depends on the strategies that organizations have put in place to execute some of these uh, programs, you know? For instance, you know increasingly people's attention span are getting shorter. So why are you going to keep people for, for hours, you know, in online meetings, you know? If there are physical meetings, there is a sense in which, I mean, uh, 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 re uh, relationship, you know, re relational uh, experiences make uh, to cushion the effect of such. But when you are online and you get people stationed at a place, I think it's just important that you manage some processes Keep them within time and make sure that uh, they are as lively as uh, as the one we are having at the moment. Okay, thank you, uh, Ukori. There is a question for you. It says, would you say NCDC has engaged enough private stakeholders in the quest to communicate the message of the pandemic to the targeted publics? So I think two things to ask um, or two things to highlight. What do you mean by private stakeholders? Are they private companies or the Nigerian citizens? Um, in terms of, you know, the private sector, um, Anne mentioned, you know, the private sector has really um, showed up in this pandemic, um, whether supporting um, communication activities or airtime, or SMS, um, you know, to ensure that we're getting our messages out um, to Nigerians. Or if I'm looking at the Nigerian public, remember we're looking at a population of like over 200 million people. And realistically, um, I will not tell you that the NCDC alone has engaged 200 million Nigerians. However, the strength that we have has been in the partnerships that we have on different levels. So when you're looking at the state governments, because you have um, the Nigerians as their constituencies, um, you're looking at the MDAs that are working in you know, different um, sectors that we engage with and we disseminate our messages to. Um, you're looking at um, influencers, whether they're community influencers or religious influencers, you know, that we engage with as well. And um, 
associations. Um, so the medical and the public associations that you know we engage with to get messaging down. And um, most importantly, to think about the fact that we're not only trying to use social media or traditional media as our means or channels um, to get the messaging down. So you also have you know, SMS, you have community engagement um, activities. Um, a lot of our partners are involved in, whether they're the international organizations or um, people like NOA, um, who go down to the communities and have um, sensitization campaigns and also the popular campaign that NCDC is currently running, which is Take Responsibility, um, is Take Responsibility Challenge that you would have heard echoed um, beyond social media um, when a lot of people are talking about the messages and compliance, they urge people to take responsibility. That has gone um, down to the grassroots. Now there are challenges, and we know that there are challenges, right? But we're continuously working um, to ensure that, you know, at least at the end of the day, that these messages get to um, the Nigerians in the, in the grassroots, in the villages, um, in the in the speak that they understand or the language they understand and through the credible media that they trust. So whether they're their community rulers who were also engaging um, or the religious leaders that they trust. Um, and in the earlier days, um, through the partnerships we had with some companies or um, the UN agencies, we're also um, privy to some celebrities um, in the beginning. But I think moving forward, as, as things are opening up, we're going back to the new normal. People are engaging more in their communities. So it's also just reinforcing the information in the communities through the people that they trust um, in those communities. So that will be my response for that question. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, uh, it's a good uh, takeoff for this question meant for me. Someone says it appears it appears that with the use of the hashtag, the target audiences are those who use social media. They say stats have shown that conservatively, 60% Nigerians are still disconnected from the digital world. Was there any attempt to reach those populace who do not have phones or any other form of mobile communication gadgets? Did you go beyond the digital? Th th thank you. I mean, it's so uh, it's so interesting to take a question from uh, uh, somebody of that caliber. Uh, I think it's a privilege to take that question. And I will just say this: uh, at the Nigerian Communications Commission, the emphasis is cross-media, multimedia engagement, and we 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 prioritize collaboration and partnership. I mean, beyond what you will find in a government organization. When I made reference to hashtag, I spoke in context. Context in the sense that the moment this virus uh, became a reality that humanity had to confront, we knew that substantially, in many fundamental ways, our, our activities migrated to the online platforms. And so, what do we do? You take the advantage of the medium that is available to deal with the, the challenge that you have at the moment. So we weren't just using uh, social media, even though the reality today also is that uh, the rainy paradigm of communication is, is the digital public communication culture. So, but we also take care of those who are not on social media and we are able to reach people. You remember also that we have zonal offices. We have zonal offices in, in, in Lagos, in Ibadan in Kano, uh, in Enugu. And so those zone offices are also opened where staff within the category permissible by, by, by the federal government uh, uh, COVID measures also go to, uh, to work and attend to, to, to people. So we use all the media, the mainstream, the digital, and, and, and sometimes uh, uh, we, we try to engage, you know, uh, people even one-on-one. -on -one. For instance, I am in the department of a, uh, of uh, consumer affairs where, I mean, I'm one of the people engaged in the decks on consumer information and education. And uh, we, we, don't have, we don't have Christmas, we don't have break. I mean, we take on uh, complaints as they come. 
So, and those complaints don't come only through the social media, they come through several channels. We have our emails, ncc at ncc.gov.ng. If you send us a mail now, escalating a complaint that you had uh, sent to your oper operator earlier and they were not well attended to, you will be answered, even as I speak. My colleagues are working. So, I mean, as a way of responding to the distinguished citizen, uh, I would say that uh, we use a multimedia cross media platform. I would like to stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, one Chido, two comments, uh, if you don't mind. Um, one on uh, Unkori's question around the private sector involvement, right? Um, I think just to add that it really is not only a burden on the NCDC. Uh, private sector needs to also step up and take responsibility. The hashtag take responsibility is not only for the populace, right? Organizations need to step up. And we have seen examples, right, of them really stepping up and taking charge. We saw at the beginning banks literally, you know, just dropping a lot of money to support the government. We've seen, you know, private entities donate PPEs, donate food banks. Don like, we have really seen public organizations step up. So I, I really think it is a two-way street. Um, there is a tendency to want to make a one-party responsibility, and it is not. Private sector needs to step up. Just as the NCDC is doing its part, they need to partner and not just wait for the NCDC to reach out, right? They also need to kind of show up as citizens, as responsible citizens as well. That's that piece. On, on the question to Amoni, I, I want to say that, yes, there's social media. Yes, there are different means of communication. Yes, there is, you know, the, the broadcast and all. But how about citizens actually taking responsibility? You don't live on an island. You live in a family, you live with people, neighbors, communities. What are you doing to spread the word? What are you doing to drive this communication? What are you doing in your enlightened state to enlighten others? Right? We cannot just say, oh, it's social media. Oh, okay, so you're only reaching half of the population. You also, as an individual, as a person, as a family member, as a community member, step up, share this information speak to people, convince others who do not, who have not reached the same level of understanding as you have, right? There's something to be said about word of mouth, right? Do it so that we can come to see this collective, you know, growth and, and hopefully get to the end of this pandemic. Chido. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we note one of the questions or contributions from the audience, Mr. Yemi Adeboye. Mr. Adeboye was, Public Relations Manager at Unilever Nigeria, and he says from his experience, one of the best ways to avoid Zoom fatigue is to have no more than one session per day and keep it within an hour. Well, we are just at the hour mark with this session and we, are, we intend to go no more than one hour, 30 minutes, but we will round up. Thank you, Mr. Adeboy. Uh, so we go back to our questions. And the key question, we have tackled internal communications uh, very importantly. But there is a question here, and I'd like Anne to address it. It says information is key, we often hear. But is all information key during the pandemic trajectory, especially as there is too much information coming from everywhere? Do we filter out what we send for our stakeholders to avoid over communicating? Or is it okay to give all information without losing focus on what's really important? What? Yeah. Um, I, I think this is where we kind of underline what it means to be a strategic communicator, right? Strategic communications means putting together a kind of a a portfolio of communication tactics to drive an outcome. So definitely filtering the information, definitely making sure that what you're saying, of course, is, is true, is, is fact-based, um, it's relevant to, the, to your population or to your target audience is pretty much the, the bedrock of good communications. And to make, take it to the strategic level, it's really to make sure that it is targeted. The, the era of spray and pray is a kind of non-existent, right? So you can't just have a bank of information and just keep churning it out. No, you really have to take a step back as a 
business communicator or a strategy communicator and look at your bank of messages, define your stakeholder map, and kind of tailor the messages to each of, you know, to, to each of your target audiences and then have a rhythm, right? So it cannot also be, you know, you do one and then you're silent for a long while and then um, from nowhere you are, you're kind of barraging your audience with multiple messages at the same time. So there has to be some thoughts to it. It has to be strategic. Um, it has to kind of have a, a final outcome or you should be leading to an objective or, or an outcome. And that will help you kind of navigate um, what you should or should not send, what's important, what's relevant, what's fact-based, uh, and what you can leverage. Thank you very much. Uh, I, luckily, we have two of you women on this panel. There's a question here from Mr. Ade Adebite. He says, my neighbor's wife needed to prepare a report for her office, but constantly got distracted by the children. She became agitated with the timeline and had to devise a prank. She dressed up for office and arranged with her maid to leave the door ajar. The children bade her bye-bye only for her to tiptoe back to one of the rooms where she locked herself for hours. How do we manage communications that will be women-centered in the face of this new normal, especially in the private sector? Women working from home. You know, it's, I would take this one, right? But I would also love to hear a man's perspective. Because these, without sounding um, like a, you know, a, a, an angry feminist, the family setup is husband, wife, and children. Like, so, I mean, let me not make assumptions that um, they're, they're, it's not the same. It's not the same for everyone. There's something called, you know, sharing of responsibilities. So, yes, the private sector has a role to play in, in making sure that, you know, the, the you know, work-life balance, harmony is kind of makes room for the challenges that a woman typically faces. But I think there's also a sharing of responsibility that we all have to stand up to men and women alike. So if party A knows that Mrs. has a deadline, there needs to be some support to kind of, you know, organize or, or you know, keep the, the kids entertained at that time. It may or may not be the case, so let me not make any assumptions. But I would say this is what I was talking about with regards to harmony, right? I, I wrote an article on LinkedIn uh, maybe a year and a half ago around having a support structure. And it's not very easy for many women, but I think it's super critical if you want to have a career. You need to have a plan A, plan B, plan C. It's just how it works, right? So whether it's your nanny, whether it's your family member, whether it's a daycare center, I mean, now we can't do daycare because of COVID, but, but we really have to think through intentionally around the support structure you're going to have to be able to manage work um, and your responsibility as a mother or as a wife. Um, but I mean, it doesn't take away from the underlying responsibility of shared family duties. If I am successful today, it's because Mr. Eze has been really a partner in sharing. And many women today who are able to be successful is because you know, the men, uh, brothers, fathers, husbands, have really stepped up and owned narrative, not just in saying, but in actually doing, right? So you are able to travel, you are able to you know, attend meetings, you are able to be locked up for five hours to do your work because you have a partner who is supporting. And when the reverse is the case, when he has to be the one to get locked up for five hours and he has to deliver a report, right? Then you, you kind of pass the button uh, back and forth. Uh, this would be my recommendation. This is what has worked for me. Um, this is what I think should be the going standard. It's not always the case, but it's what we hope and you know, anticipate and work for or work towards. Okay, thank you. Okay. 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 Yeah, I, I mean, just, just, just before we quarry, because uh, I mean, Anne has said that uh, she would like to hear a man's voice. And you know, Anne, I just want to let you know this. You got an ally in Omoni because, I mean, for, for, for decades, I have been um, 
a, a women's rights activist and they're working within organizations that permit uh, even uh, male membership of women-focused uh, organizations. I mean, like women in Nigeria, for instance, where, I mean, I, I was once the assistant national secretary, I mean, in Nigeria, you know. So, so all, all you have said, I will say that uh, I agree with you entirely. And this morning, I almost came late to work because, I mean, my wife had to do uh, something briefly in the neighborhood and I had to take charge of, of the kids. It will interest you to know that uh, there is absolutely nothing that my wife does at home that I also do not do. If it's not convenient for her, I will do it. I mean, and she appreciates this much. So for, as somebody who believes that uh, women, I mean, uh, tend to suffer a discrimi a additional discrimination on account of their, of their biological constitution, I, I, I think that uh, we need to do the, let that be clear from home. And my son knows that there are things that he needs to do not just the sisters. So I'm with you. You got an ally. I'll stop there. Okay. Before you have something to add? <laughs> I, I, I mean, for me, it's a, it's a bit different. So I, I work out of state, and my husband is with the kids. Um, but we also have a very good support system. And this has been happening for over two years. Um, but I also recognize that people are not as lucky as I am. Um, and also maybe to challenge organizations and communicators to also um, think about policies, organizational policies that um, favor women. Um, I have a sister who is working at home, taking care of three children. So most times when she's on her Zoom calls, three people are parading in and out, um, you know, walking around, somebody's crying, somebody's screaming, um, and she might not have the support system that I have, but she's still expected to um, perform at the same level as her um, male colleagues or counterparts. So maybe something that, you know, since um, there's a lot of encouragement on um, working from home, you know, that organizations also take into consideration um, things like this um, in terms of the deliverables that are expected. Um, nonetheless, from, from the women who work for them as well. Okay, thank you. I have a question and I'll throw it open. Someone says, how can the experts gain the confidence of Nigerians who mostly prefer other sources of information with regards to the pandemic? Uh, Williams Karim seems to imply that we need to go beyond traditional and social media what do you think? So I can go first um, with that, and I, I, I totally agree, right? So it's now thinking about sustainability of the messages that have been coming out. So in terms of thinking about Nollywood, um, you know, the creative industry in, in general, that people kind of gravitate towards, right, um, that are not traditionally what you would think about um, immediately. How can um, we now start to engage um, groups like that to um, have movies or films that reinforce um, the, um, the behavior that, you know, we want um, to, um, to change, basically, um, because a lot of people watch, you know, Nollywood or or even um, Telemundo. I don't know how we can reach Telemundo, but, you know, <laughs> I'll talk about the ones that we can definitely reach. Um, so it's, it's to think about that really. And I think that we have a gold mine there. Um, this is for the, the older adults and for children looking at um, cartoons, um, you know, that they watch that can reinforce um, messaging. I've seen one from Ant Hill Studios, which I really love and have shared with my children, and they also appreciate it a lot. And is is um is Nigerian um, too, so they relate to the characters. And so it's it's important that you know as we're moving along that we start to think about you know those type of um, ways to engage people, get them to understand the importance of you know the measures that were that we're asking or the things that we're asking of them, whether it's wearing a face mask, 
um, washing hands, the physical social distancing, um, and also not attending mass gatherings and things like that, um, that would help reinforce in a way that, you know, is not overbearing, but, you know, enjoyable moving forward. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was going to say that, uh, you know, uh, the, the question is apt and therefore, uh, just to uh, amplify Okori's voice, let me just share the experience we had in managing uh, the outbreak of uh, avian influenza in 2006 in Nigeria. I mean, I was uh, a special media advisor to information minister at that time. And what we did was to use all available media, all available media, besides the fact that we had uh, access to TV, we had the email addresses. I mean, it wasn't the age of social media, but we had the email addresses of all editors of news and current affairs in all state and federal, uh, federally owned TV and radio stations, as well as newspapers. We also had the uh, avian influenza bulletin. And I mean, there were times we issued two bulletins in a day because we broke the story as the news came out. Importantly, we also had contact through uh, federal information centers. I'm sure you recall we used to have federal information center. I mean, each federal information center in Nigeria at that time had uh, several vehicles. And I know one or two of their vehicles are motorized public address system. And by the way, Corey, it's fantastic uh, to see that NCDC also use motorized uh, public address system even in managing information for COVID because I saw them at some rural points, you know, uh, where they, they, they were disseminating information uh, about COVID. So the, 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 the issue is to use all, med all media that are available to the people you plan to reach up to the villages, even though I know that managing COVID is, is, is different. But again, in indigenous communication, the, the town crier, in a sense, is also a motorized public address system. And so every other thing that we can use to ensure that uh, we gain the trust of people is important. I will emphasize the fact that yes, trust level has dropped, but it is not only in Nigeria, it's all over the world. Trust between people and government has dropped drastically. And so you have to be able to use the appropriate strategy. One of them, and I would, uh, on the final note, one of them is to use people with credibility. Who are you using to amplify your voice? If you want your voice to be amplified, you use people that are credible and the people will believe them. I'd like to stop there. Thank you. You just mentioned multi-step flow theory and two-step flow theory in communication. Uh, I have this question for Anne, and uh, I think we will be rounding up. How can organizations keep their advocacy relevant and timely while harnessing the power of global audiences to continue to achieve their objectives, taking into account media, in-person channels, and lobbying? Um, I, I think uh, the, the, a pandemic is not the time to spin. A pandemic is not the time to be ambiguous. Uh, a pandemic is not the time to kind of um, do any self-promotion in a, a blatant, flagrant way. So I, I would say advocacy, lobbying, should really be tied to the current things. I think, first of all, basic, open, truthful, fact-based communication with all your stakeholders. Fingers crossed that you have done the necessary pre-COVID to build trust with your, with your constituencies, like with your audiences and with your stakeholders, particularly the media. Because if you have built trust, you really be starting on a negative. Um, I would also say the when you when you key into the current things and so today it's it's safety it's um protecting employees it's business continuity it's kind of staying afloat how does your organization show up under these things and how you promote it to the media is what this is this is what advocacy is right it, it is like i said it's not the time for speaking it's not the time to be ambiguous 
if you do not have all the information, acknowledge it and kind of really just be open and truthful and factual. Uh, lobbying at this stage, uh, like I said, governments are under pressure. Stakeholders are literally under pressure. So the, if it's not for the overall good of the society, I, I would recommend to ha ha really have a rethink. Really have a rethink. Focus on open, factual-based communication. Focus on strategies to, to help business continuity. Um, key into the current trends. Make sure that you, your relationships with media and your stakeholders is built on trust. And hopefully all of that will come together to, to kind of push your, your organization's you know, objectives forward. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank all of you. Uh, maybe 30 seconds to one minute each, a last word before we hand over to Yemi Adeyemi to say a vote of thanks. Yes? A last word, any last words? Or we, yes. we, we call the, the, our the, host? The last, the, la the last one from me yeah. is, is to say that um, should anybody have an uh, issue with uh, telecommunications, maybe you have one or two complaints to, to, to lodge, don't hesitate to send a mail to ncc at ncc.gov.ng or you reach us on our social media handles Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and on YouTube. Finally, it's been a pleasure being part of this conversation. I've learned so much. I hope I've given a little. Please keep safe. Thank you very sincerely. Thank you. Yep. Sorry. Um, okay, from my, okay, from my own end. Um, from my own end, I'll, I'll echo some of the things Anne has said, you know, whether it's for businesses or um, individuals like us, you know, to really take responsibility and also bank on word of mouth um, and checking other people. For example, if you're going somewhere and someone's not wearing a face mask, you know, to demand that, you know, that happens before you talk to them. Um, so you're protecting yourself, you're protecting others. Um, basically, because this fight is basically for all of us, not one agency um, or the government alone. We can't really do it um, on our own. And just to also say that, you know, I've really learned so much um, today from the, from the really experienced panelists that have been on here. And it's been a pleasure even for those that, that have taken out time to attend. So thank you. And I look forward to continuing conversation on um, Twitter, UK Onuma, or um, or LinkedIn, um, Ukwari GB. So please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Okay, so we'll hear from our host, Shola Abulu. Shola? Uh, just so, one, one, one <laughs> uh, you know, I think my, my last would be um, just clear recommendations for business communicators who are on the phone today. Right, the, the a pandemic is a crisis, like, may, like many other crises that they will experience in their career. It's not a time for panic or fear. I mean, just follow the crisis communications guidelines. You know, prepare scenarios. Think, you know, think multi-scenario level versus one one dimensional, and and that should work. Focus on innovating. And uh, once you innovate and you have those strategies in place, focus on delivering with speed because I think um, the race is to the swift right now. Um, with regards to this pandemic. And I would say finally, once you have innovated and you have you know, delivered with speed, make sure you report your results. Make sure you share your results with your principals, with the organization, so that you pretty much close the loop as a communicator and you grow your, your personal brand within the organization and without, so that you, you, you know, just raise your profile uh, and strengthen your, your position as a strategic communicator um, for the organization. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. I, I really, I was wondering how we would cope for an hour and a half and I literally didn't see the time fly by. So this has been a, a really wonderful experience. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Shala. 
Yes, so thank you. I hope you can hear me well. Um, thank you so much to our esteemed panelists, you know, for first of all coming here, short, short notice. This has been an excellent session. Thank you to Dr. Nii, thank you to Anne, thank you to Corey. I have learned so much today. Thank you to our wonderful participants and all who registered. And our excellent moderator, Chido, it's been a wonderful time. We're so much appreciative of everything that you've done and the time that we've had today. Um, we will, you'll be hearing from us, everyone who has registered, those of us still on the call, we're going to send you um, an email after this. And if you want to contact us, we are the West Africa Interest Group of the IABC, and we're very much open for business, if you know what I mean. So if you want to know more, you want to join a community of um, communications professionals, please just reach out to us. We're here, and we're here to support. And we'll be, this is the first, the maiden edition, this is the first of a series of virtual talk series that we're going to be holding over the next few months. And we'll be bringing more panelists, people, and when you write, when we write to you, please give us your ideas of what you would want to hear about. Your feedback is most welcome. May I once again say thank you, uh, esteemed panelists. Thank you so much for the time today. We'll be calling on you again. I hope you will come if we do so. And um, so please continue to stay safe. Ukori, continue to keep the flag flying. We're very proud of your work at NCDC. Um, and continue to be an advocate, you know, for women, for everything in GE, you know. Continue to be that person that speaks to the organization and tell them that you have to remain connected to what's happening externally. That is the job of a communications professional. You have to ha be the external heir and let the organization know what they need to do to keep on track with whatever is happening externally. And Dr. Nii, thank you so much as well for also providing that connect for us in terms of communications, in terms of our, our, shape of, our side of the field and the technical digital transformation element of this as well. So on that note, I'd like to say thank you and um, hand back to Chido, I guess, before we bring it to a close. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thank you so much. I was to say to all 53 participants who showed up, thank you so much. We appreciate you. We know that about 160 people registered. It's midday. It's uh, right in the afternoon. Some of them couldn't make it. We hope to see you next time. Uh, just know that when we say we'll start at two, we'll actually start at two and we'll end in time. So be encouraged. Uh, we will share the learnings, some of what our experts have told us. We will share them with you. We'll probably also send a recording to everyone who registered. Have a nice day. Stay safe in this pandemic and stay connected. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.